Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the next lesson in our series of lessons about the Constitutional Convention. Um, in this particular case, we're going to throw a few things into the mix. Uh, we're going to talk about how long uh, federal officials who are up for election, like congressmen, senators, and the president, um, as well as federal judges, uh, can serve. We're going to talk about the third article of the Constitution that sets up the judicial branch. And we're also going to be talking about something called checks and balances, which are built into the Constitution so that no one part of the government can overwhelm or muscle out the others. So rather than giving you essential questions, I'm going to give you these three topics. And uh, before the end of the lesson, all three of these topics will be explained in detail. So we're going to go ahead and start off by discussing uh, kind of a follow-up to the previous two lessons, the lessons on the legislative and the executive branches, Articles 1 and 2. Um, how long can elected federal officials serve? So elected federal officials would be members of the House of Representatives, members of the Senate, the President, and the Vice President of the United States. So to begin with, let's start with the House of Representatives, which is the part of Congress which is based on a state's population. Um, basically, members of the House of Representatives are always running for re-election because they only serve two-year terms and they are elected from districts. So other than the states with the smallest populations like Alaska, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, etc., um, they run only from a portion of a state, not the entire state. That, that portion is called a district. Uh, members of the House can run for re-election as many times as they like, so long as the voters keep voting them in. But they always have to worry about the voters because they are always running for re-election. Um, the U.S. Senate is a different story. If you are a U.S. Senator... Um, you actually serve a six-year term. So if you're elected, you do not have to worry about running again for another six years. Um, you are elected from an entire state. So in a place like California or Texas or Florida, uh, running for re-election is very expensive and you have to travel around a lot. Um, but you can run for re-election as many times as you want. Um, the reason they chose six-year terms was that senators are exposed to have a longer view of things and if they're constantly worried about being reelected, um, they're not going to have the uh, the wisdom that they're supposed to have so they wanted senators to to take a longer view of things so they gave them a longer term um, we've kind of already discussed this the president of the united states serves a four-year term um, after franklin delano roosevelt uh, they decided to limit the president to two four-year terms. So a president can be re-elected once, and after the president is re-elected once, um, they cannot be elected again. Uh, that's since 1950-something. And the president is elected by the Electoral College, which we did discuss in the last lesson. Then there are federal judges. This is a cushy gig, folks, because once a federal judge is confirmed by the Senate, they serve for life. So until they die or they resign, they have very good job security and they have a very large impact on what happens in our country. Um, just in case you didn't know, in the United States, the general election is held the first Tuesday in November in even-numbered years. So uh, the 2020 election will be the first Tuesday in November in 2020. Now we're going to discuss the judicial branch. The judicial branch is the next branch of government. We know the legislative branch writes the laws. We know the executive branch enforces the laws. The judicial branch is the branch of government that is responsible for interpreting the laws. So if there's any disagreement over what the law says or what the Constitution says, 
The Supreme Court is the place where those disagreements are supposed to be, here's a fancy word for you, adjudicated. So the judicial branch is actually a very short section of the Constitution. There's not much in there. But our essential question is, how was the federal court system established? You can write that on the left side of the line, and I will go ahead and give you the bullet point soup here. First thing you need to know is that Article 3 created a federal court system, which did not exist under the Articles of Confederation, and it establishes the U.S. Supreme Court. So it doesn't matter whether you're talking Virginia plan or New Jersey plan, both plans included a court system, and this Supreme Court was supposed to be the place where the, the biggest cases, the most important cases that affect the entire country get decided. Um, it also gives Congress the power to create lower courts. So the Constitution creates the Supreme Court, but all the other courts that exist in the country are not in the Constitution. They are created by acts of Congress. Um, and so if you look at this little graphic over here, you can see um, kind of how that works out. And when you're talking about the court system, keep in mind, we're talking about the federal court system, the United States court system. We're not talking about the system in Oregon or California or Washington. Those are state courts. We are talking about federal courts. Um, the Supreme Court gets to decide what laws are or aren't constitutional. So if Congress passes and the president signs a law that contradicts something in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights, then the Supreme Court can step in, look at that law, and decide whether or not it does or does not fit under the Constitution. If they decide that it doesn't, then that law is no longer a law. It is literally voided by the Supreme Court. So that gives the Supreme Court pretty enormous power. Um, and this kind of goes to the, the, uh, the things I just said. If a law goes against the Constitution, the Supreme Court can ixnay it, and uh, they can literally void out the law. So that's a very, very powerful thing. Um, things like uh, same-sex marriage, abortion, um, affirmative action, uh, very controversial things in our society often get decided by the Supreme Court. And that makes the court... Um, a political hot potato, folks. You can ask me about that. Uh, justices of the Supreme Court serve for life. We mentioned that when we talked about uh, terms of office. Justices of the Supreme Court, very cushy gig. Until you die or resign, you can be there for a very long time. And basically, one of the president's greatest powers is deciding who sits on the Supreme Court. Because whoever sits on the Supreme Court is one of nine people, there's nine members of the Supreme Court, who decides the weightiest issues in our society. And uh, you can be a lightning rod, and uh, judges don't have to run for election, so they can literally just vote based upon what their actual views are, because other than the fear of being impeached, they don't ever have to worry about losing their jobs. I believe I already mentioned that the decisions of the court really affect society. But in case I didn't mention it, there it is. So let's go ahead and talk about federalism. We've talked about these three branches of government. And federalism is this notion that there are different layers of government, much like a kick. It's a system that shares power between the state and national government. So we have a federal government. The United States government sets laws for the entire country. We have a state government. The state of Oregon sets laws that only are valid within the state. And then we have local laws. So for example, if we live in the city of Salem, Salem has local laws and ordinances that only have force and power within the city limits of Salem. There's also Marion County. So if you're not in the city of Salem, you're under the Marion County Sheriff's Department, you have to deal with the laws of Marion County. That's how federalism works. So this is a very important concept. It's also another left side question. 
what are checks and balances? And the key here is that the entire Constitution was written so that no one branch of government had too much power. Each one of the branches of government has the ability to check the other branches and provide balance within the system. And this is what we call checks and balances. This is what made the Constitution a quantum leap ahead from the Articles of Confederation. And the idea was to prevent unlimited power and tyranny. Because remember, we fought the revolution to get away from tyranny. So the Constitution sets up a system where no one branch of government could dominate the others. So for example, Congress can pass a law, the president can veto the law. So the president has a check on the Congress. All of the branches have an ability to check the other branches, meaning not give them unlimited power. The president can't choose just anybody to serve in a cabinet agency. He needs Senate approval. The Congress can't just pass any old law. They have to get the president to sign off on it. The Congress and the president together can't pass a law that strips out some constitutional protection because the judicial branch will come in and render that law unconstitutional. So they all have the ability to prevent the other branches from getting out of control. Um, that's especially interesting in a time like now, uh, in the year 2019, where we're about to go through an impeachment inquiry. The judicial branch may have to ste step in and be a referee between what's going on in the legislative branch that's trying to impeach the president and the executive branch, which obviously the president does not want to be impeached and removed from office. All of the branches need each other to function properly. If one branch gets out of control, you can end up with what's called a constitutional crisis. And um, we've been dealing with quite a bit of that the last few years and it's really stretched the Constitution uh, to its limit, and it's going to be very interesting to see how that all plays out. When one branch of government is in conflict with another, it's very hard for anything to get done, and as I've already alluded to, there's been a lot of that in recent years, and so a constitutional crisis can occur. A constitutional crisis occurs when one branch of government exceeds its legal authority and the other branches of government do not effectively have the ability to stop that from happening. Stay tuned, kids. Discuss. Clearly, if you have a constitutional crisis, it can be dangerous for the country because it can rip at the fabric of what we consider to be stable and predictable and it can make things seem dangerous, unpredictable, and unstable. So we covered a lot today. We covered three different topics, but as always, I am going to ask you to write a summary. And in your summary, I want you to take a few moments to discuss how long different members of the federal government can serve, uh, discuss the judicial branch specifically, how it's set up, and discuss what checks and balances are and why they are important in our constitutional system of government. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, raspy voice and all, this is Mr. Blumendahl once again signing off on the Waldo Middle School Social Studies YouTube Network.